uploaded. And we will make the link to the archive and any resources that were shared today available to you next week. There's also a chance that we might not get to all of your questions today, and if that's the case, I'll be sure to pull out those questions, share them with the presenters, and get written responses back to you, hopefully within the week. To access the slides, simply view the handout box toward the right-hand portion, lower portion of the uh, menu pane there and you'll see handouts and you can simply just download the slides. Today we have a wonderful moderator, Tanya Spillavoy is part of our WCET steering committee here and I've had a chance to work with her over the last couple years. She's a very busy woman. She directs the distance education and state authorization efforts at the North Dakota University System. She leads 11 public institutions in distance and online education, and she's also a regular regulator for post-secondary degree granting institutions. So I'd like to go ahead and introduce Tanya and pass it over to have her run us through the presenters and then we'll jump into the presentation. But if you have any questions, do enter them into the question box and we'll get to those as we go along. Tanya. Sorry about Hi that, Tanya. Hi everybody, this is Tanya Spilavoy. Um, I'm really glad to be here with you all today and we have some excellent presenters. Um, as you go through the uh, presentation, go ahead and type your questions in the chat box and I'll do my best to um, help the presenters answer those questions for you as we go along. So first we have Carol Aslanian. She's the founder and president of Aslanian Market Research. She's a national authority on the characteristics and learning patterns of adult and post-traditional undergraduate and graduate students. She has made hundreds of presentations and has authored numerous articles and reports on the topic. For more than 20 years, she worked at the College Board in support of all adult learning services, and Ms. Eslanian has led market research projects for more than 300 colleges, universities, and educational agencies. So we're excited to have her here today. Uh, she also has her colleagues along, and one of them is David Kleinfelter. He's the Chief Academic Officer of Learning House. Um, prior to joining Learning House, he served as Chief Academic Officer of for-profit and online universities, uh, Walden and Kaplan, and as the president of Graceland University, he was an, it's an in early innovator in online education. Uh, we also have joining us Andrew Magda. He's the manager of market research of the Learning House, and he leads the development of custom and large-scale market research studies and assists partner institutions with their research needs. Uh, prior to Learning House, Andrew was a senior analyst at EduVentures and a project manager at the Center for Survey Research and Analysis at the University of Connecticut. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to the presenters. And um, as you listen to the presentation, you can uh, type your questions and we'll do our best to answer as we go along. Uh, Carol. Carol, you may be on mute. There you go. Go ahead. Thank you, Tanya. It's great to be here. And I know we have a, an enthusiastic large uh, audience of somewhat of 400 people and many, many different institutions, public, private, and even some individual companies. So let's move on and share with you today what we have learned about online students in 2016. So moving to our first slide, I think this is a very upbeat slide, and I, I, I'm absolutely confident that you'll agree with me. This is a beautiful slide of the growth in online enrollment from 2000, year 2000, and when we say online, we mean totally online. These figures represent students who have taken all their program courses and degree work totally online. So as you can see, where we are today at around 2016, um, we are at about, and I'm saying we're edging up to 4 million students, and you know that that's 4 million of about 19 million students, and I'm saying we're edging up to about 20%, almost one out of five students in American higher education is learning fully 
online. So I think that's good news for us, and it seems like if we believe the estimates for the rest of the chart, uh, it can go nowhere but up. So good news for you out there who are supplying online programs or deciding whether to supply them. Let me tell you a little bit about the methodology and how we did this. Can you move on? We administered the survey, as we have for the last four or five years, to a random sample of 1,500 respondents using our online survey panel. And we work very closely with an organization that has done this kind of survey work for us for years. And to qualify as a respondent to this survey, you had to have the following characteristics. You had to be 18 years of age or older. You had to have a minimum of a high school degree or diploma or GED. And most important, you had to have recently enrolled, and we mean recently by within the last three years, you had to recently enroll, be currently enrolled, or had firm plans to enroll in a fully online college degree certificate or license program in the next year. So we're not talking to people who have aspirations, interests, or desires, or needs. We're talking to customers. We're talking to customers who've done it, are doing it, and will enroll within a year or so. So they're firm uh, uh, conveyors of who they went to, why they went, and what brought them into this uh, medium of learning, which is what you all want to know about to attract your share of this growing market. Next, let's, let's just give you a quick overview of their demographics. And we compared two years, but let's pay attention to that year 2016 as we compared it to our first year, 2012. Well, no news to all of you who have been in the marketplace of uh, higher education, particularly among um, those in online education. It's a female-dominated market, and it has been and continues to be and probably will be in the near future, but that's no surprise because most of higher education enrollments today are dominated by women. The average age is going down. This is where I'd like you to see the two ages. The average age was 33 in 2012, but moved down to 31. That's a big jump. Let me tell you, that's a big jump uh, in 2016. Yes, the online learner is getting younger. Average income, and I think we've all heard about this, given the rising cost of college and tuition and so forth, that it is a strain on many incoming students, and this is why. Average income has gone down among those who are seeking further education, and this is particularly for those who are seeking online education, but let me tell you, in uh, Slaney and Market Research, done for dozens of colleges each year, where the, whether it's ground, hybrid, or online, that income level has gone down among the current student body. Employment status, yes, the slight majority are employed full-time, I'd say maybe 55% or so, but you also have to remember we have many part-time uh, uh, part students and also those who are, are unemployed. So when we say full-time working adults in our promotional materials, be careful because only, only slightly more than half are really employed full-time, but they do take the, the hot spot here. Another indication of their uh, concern about cost has to do with the lessening of tuition reimbursement, which I believe many of you can be witness to, and whereas in 2012 they received it, in 2016 many of them had it, have it, had it disappear. Further, on, in regard to the age of online students, next slide, um, I want to give you a little, little bit more emphatic description of what we're saying about average age going down. Just look at that undergraduate column. If you I would suspect that many of you who are offering undergraduate online programs have begun to notice this if you take tally of it. We've noticed it in our market studies across the country for individual colleges. And yes, online students are getting younger. This probably has a lot to do with the fact that 50% of traditional age students in undergraduate programs do not finish in four years, and many do not finish in six years and they leave early with, with handfuls of credit. They go off and work, and when they come to be 22, 23, 24, 25, guess what they say to themselves? Wow, I better go back and get that degree. I need that credential. And so they're coming onto online because if they are working, they don't want to stop working, 
you will see that as a major, major pattern that will hold firm, I think, in the years to come. At the graduate level, they too, given uh, similar reasons, uh, can't lose my job, I want to keep working, and I didn't get quite what I wanted in earlier years, uh, I need to go on with my graduate program. So uh, for your marketing and promotional materials, um, you've got to remember, it's not that middle-aged uh, working full-time adult. We have a whole range of students here, as you do in your regular program. The next slide is a very interesting tale. Um, distance from the closest campus. We said to them, the college in which you were enrolled for your online program, how far was it from where you live? And if you added up those, the blue lines, which is 2016, just let's look at that, 57% said they lived within 50 miles of the campus, and another 17 added up to within 100 miles. So we have 74% of online learners living in the region where they attend the school. And we that is a very strong pattern. So many of you institutions out there that are more regional and uh, you know, like Dallas, I think Dallas Community College is in our in as our an audience, um, and a lot of uh, the university systems in California, which are in our audience, um, your closest and best buyers are ones who live. Your best buyers are probably those who live closest to you. So when we're working for small institutions across the country, uh, small privates, for example, will say, if we're going to do a marketing plan, please let's saturate the closest. 100 miles and maybe the next 200 miles, you're far more likely to draw from nearer residents than farther residents, particularly if you're not offering a boutique niche topic that you need a, a greater audience for. So distance from the campus is, is lessening. Uh, most of your market for most of your institutions, and, a, and these are the ones that probably are more regional in nature and smaller liberal arts institutions, uh, your best market is closest to where you are located. That was the undergraduate and the pattern is very similar at the graduate level on the next slide. And that is not 74% but close, 73% live within 100 miles of the institution which they enroll in for online programs. Very, very important to your marketing outreach and uh, patterns of communication and so forth. Uh, next, we'll look at the number of visits, which, which should correlate with this, and 76% um, in 2016 did visit that campus um, one or more times. 2% more than, I think that is more than 30, more than 10 times. So um, there is a reason. The reason they like those local institutions is because people know you, employers understand who you are. Uh, friends and relatives attended, and if they need help, they can walk over or drive over and get the help they need or that they want certain services. So for many of you institutions that are regional in nature, this is very good news. Now, I think we hand it over to Dave. Dave, are you able to access your audio? It looks like you might have needed to dial in your pin. If not, Andrew said that he can jump in. So Andrew, why don't we get started until Dave is able to enter his audio pin. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Hello. Oh, okay. So uh, we also asked about uh, credits from prior online study uh, in the survey, as we know that, um, and as we could see, a lot of the online college students, specifically at the undergraduate level, this question was just asked to undergraduate students. You could see many of them are coming to these programs with past college credit that they're looking to transfer in a lot with significant uh, numbers of credits, as you see, uh, you know, in that um, more than 90, 60 to 90 range, well over a quarter, uh, just around a quarter of online college students are coming in with uh, heavy amounts of credit that they're looking to bring into their undergraduate degree programs. Um, so we always emphasize with our uh, colleges that we work with, uh, uh, you know, really open up those, those pathways uh, to allow students to transfer in as many credits as possible. Uh, as you see, very few are actually coming in in, the, in that what, what you would say a first-time range, which is 13% saying that they have no credits from prior study that they're looking to transfer. Um, as we know, with the um, 
uh, degree completion programs very popular online, and we also you know uh, work with our online uh, our online providers, our colleges and universities to partner with community colleges and really open up ways to bring in uh, students with these pass credits, making sure their programs are aligned with you know uh, those community college uh, standards. Those articulation agreements are very key to make sure that students are able to transfer in as many credits as they can. Uh, and the next slide. With the uh, hey, Andrew, field. oh Dave, you're there. Hi, folks. Yeah, sorry about the uh, the missing audio pin. And thanks, Andrew, for stepping in there. Uh, and we'll move on to the uh, a key topic in the questionnaire every year, and that's the field of study. The uh, data for this year has not changed very much from last year and previous years for the undergraduates. You'll notice in the slide here that about a quarter of the students are enrolled in business programs. It's far and away the number, the largest uh, enrollment choice for students in online programs, followed by health and medicine, which typically is dominated by nursing. And then you can see as you, as you scan down the other fields, which ones are uh, the ones that are most enrolled in. Interesting to note that even though fields like business and nursing and IT tend to be the top three and dominate the the, uh, the ranges here, there are lots of other disciplines and potential majors that, that are not uh, heavily subscribed by students. Andrew and I have done some uh, similar research with private institutions and find that many of them don't offer programs in these uh, lesser subscribed fields. So there is an opportunity for institutions that, that don't offer a full range of programs across all nine of these disciplines to consider other fields. They won't be as large and as populous as fields like business and, and nursing, but there is an opportunity and there seems to be less competition in some of the disciplines and fields that are uh, not quite as heavily subscribed. At the graduate level though, on the next slide, you'll see a major shift over the past uh, year. So if you look at business, it's still the number one program with about 25% or a quarter of the students. But notice what happened in computers and IT. It jumped up to number two with almost 20% of the students at the graduate level enrolled in these programs. And the big loser in terms of student enrollments was number three, education, which dropped from 22% of the enrollments to 14%. Most of the folks on the call are aware that the changes that are happening in public educational system uh, less teachers getting tuition reimbursement, going back to school, and so forth. Also, many of us are aware of the growing need in the IT industry for software developers and programmers and folks in these professions. And students, especially at the graduate level, are responding to those those changing trends in the workforce and subscribing to these programs. So again, an opportunity presents itself if. Uh, if the institution doesn't have programs in computer and IT field, it's a good one to consider as you develop and add new programs to your online offerings. We'll go on to the next slide. So one of the new questions in this year's survey was about students that had dropped out previously and then returned. And of the online students, about 30% of them, or one-third, were in this category where they were enrolled somewhere else previously in their life, and then had dropped out and had now come back. And this is the data for those folks that uh, did return. As you scan down through these uh, choices, many of them are obvious. People ran out of money or their family circumstances changed, like they had uh, got married or had children or things like that. I would like to, to point out just a couple of them, though. Uh, running out of funds is one to keep in mind, but the third one down did not see the relevance of program content. 
17% of the people chose this, they could choose multiple uh, options here. So it, they may have also chosen something like running out of funds or had family circumstances. So these aren't uh, students that just fell into one of these categories. But that's an important point to, to think about. And then below that, two more down, 14% of these people said that classes were uninteresting. And the reason I point out those three particular responses is that most of these uh, items that show up here, an institution can't do much about. We can't control their family life and their circumstances if they move or get ill or things like that. But we can control the quality of our programs, how interesting our classes are, how relevant they are to the students' uh, workplace and their activities, and in some respect, uh, how economical they are so people can afford to attend. So again, I think there's, the data presents an opportunity for us to think very carefully about how the quality of the curriculum and the instruction that goes on in our online programs how we can make that interesting and relevant for these students stay motivated to be enrolled. We'll move on to the next topic. So uh, we've asked a series of questions each year of the five years we've done the survey about why people chose the institution they did to attend. This year we, we broke them a little bit differently and focused on some items about choosing the school and then the next slide will show you are items about choosing the particular uh, uh, program that they did. And so true to past years, the top two items have always been tuition and reputation or why people choose the institution they do. Up till last year, reputation was always the number one answer. Last year it flipped, so tuition and fees became number one and that held true Again, this year, in fact, it kind of moved up in terms of a quarter of the people that, rep that selected that option. So cost and, and uh, reputation or quality, as it's perceived by the students, are really important factors to keep in mind. Convenience obviously shows up as you look down through the other choices and, and different uh, features of the in institution itself, the quality of faculty and and so forth, but uh, price continues to stand out and maybe even accelerate or move up as an important factor to pay attention to. When we go to the next slide then, where we look at, at factors in choosing a particular program, you see that flexibility is critical for these folks. Uh, flexible class schedules, they are concerned about time, and we'll get into this more in some slides later that Carol is going to present about about the speed that these people make decisions, but they want to uh, get through their program as quickly as they can once they've selected a program. And so the length of time it takes to complete is, is important for these folks. Other things are important too, content, reputation, and so forth. One of the interesting things about this, uh, this particular set of questions in the survey is that there, there are a few dominant answers. In, in many cases, the choices that the students have are kind of in opposition to one another. The full list of options is not on this slide for reasons of not being able to present them all, but if you go to the study and download it and go to these tables, there's about a dozen different choices that, student, or that respondents have. For example, there's one that says, uh, the faculty are tenured full-time professors, and another option, the faculty are part-time adjunct folks that work in the profession. And both of those will get a, a similar number of students or respondents selecting them. Uh, sometimes there'll be a, there's a choice where people can say that they want never to have to go to class and have the flexibility of never being required to attend at a specific time. So there's another option where they can select that they uh, would appreciate some synchronous activities where the whole class is together, together at a required time on the LMS or the platform. So there's no one size that fits all of these students and no one particular policy or practice that is clearly preferred. 
it makes it difficult for those of us who deliver online programs because there's not one size fits all kind of orientation. So it's important to keep in mind that for every thing that works for some students, it may not work for other students. This is the, the remainder of the choices from the slide above. As Andrew was mentioning earlier, you see the transfer credits, 11%. Thought that was an important factor, and uh, every time we've asked this survey, transfer credits comes up in the top ten of factors or reasons why people pick a particular institution. We do have a question related to that slide. If you would go back to it a mm -hmm. little bit, um, one of the people that is on the call wants to know if one of their programs has a lab component um, where students are required to do some lab time or attend a class, um, would that cause online enrollments to be smaller because you have this no set class meeting time? Um, what's your opinion on that? Yeah. This comes from Tom There's Wallace. A question. There's a question on that topic a little bit later in this presentation, but the answer is some students absolutely never want to come to campus and other students feel okay about it. So again, it's like I just said, uh, it's, a mixed, it's a mixed bag, but there'll be some students that will opt not to go if that's a requirement. And we'll show you more detailed data here a little bit later. Okay, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, I think we're moving on to marketing channels. And this is where we ask the respondents to tell us how they became more aware of institutions they would consider for enrollment. And you can see the rank listing here, uh, the mean scores on the right, and number one, you need to maximize your presence on Google, Bing, and Yahoo. That was rated most highly as a source of information and becoming aware of potential offerings from various institutions. So SEO is very important, followed by something that may surprise you, particularly but not too surprising when we said earlier that 70% select an institution in their region. Remember that? You correlate that with number two, direct mail to my home. It seems that a lot of these individuals are being inundated with uh, uh, internet-based messages and digital marketing and so forth. And if you're a nearby institution and you have something to offer within a 200-mile range that could appeal to these people, then direct mail is becoming very, very effective in reaching the nearer population. Okay. Followed by commercials on television, and I think that's been sparked by the fact that so many for-profits and a couple of not-for-profits like Liberty and Southern New Hampshire are using a television as a major medium in drawing people to the quote-unquote online learning. And next followed by news stories on local television and radio, and then posts on Facebook. And then it goes pretty much downhill from commercials on radio to YouTube on the next page, billboards and ads on Facebook. So this gives you a pretty good lineup of how to invest your marketing dollars. Turning to the use of mobile in the selection process, wow. 80% of online students use their mobile device to some extent in selecting their institution. So hopefully your processes are mobile friendly. That's a big number, 80%. Uh, and a third, a third of them, almost all or all of them use mobile, okay? So it is something that you've got to be sensitive toward in terms of making your information accessible and easy to navigate. Turning to the next page, not only do they search for you on by mobile, but they want to learn via mobile. Two-thirds of prospective online students expressed interest. And this was a question we said about a preference for the future, okay? So two-thirds said, when we said, how would you, be would you be interested in using your mobile device during your online study studies, 67%, two-thirds said, you bet. So that also requires you to think about your delivery modes and, and agility and moving to mobile delivery of instruction. Very, very important. And I can't imagine that, that if it can get any higher, it will go higher. Um, we've been visiting a lot of colleges lately and looking at their uh, enrollment funnel. And I deal with a lot of small uh, privates and some uh, community colleges and four-year public institutions. 
and uh, speed to decision is so important. Um, this first question we thought was sort of curious. Did you enroll in the school that got back to you first with the information you requested? And in 2016, half of these individuals said yes. Um, and counting those who only contacted one school, it would say to us that getting back to this population early is very important. They will choose the institution that is most responsive, and it looks like that's even more true with the graduate students. So when I visited an institution recently that takes up to three to four to five days to respond, they're losing a good share of their market to the faster respondents. Uh, not only that, in retrieving transcripts and getting recommendations if that's necessary and so forth, delaying, and worst of all, waiting for deans or directors of departments to agree to admit really takes you out of the ballgame. This is a very timely, quick uh, operation. Not that they're not good students and they're not thinking hard of what they want, they just want to get it over with. When they find that when they realize that what they want is a degree in X, Y, or Z, or a certificate, and so forth, they want to move on. And looking at the next slide, how long did it take you from the time you started your search to completing your application? 70% said four weeks or less. Now, that's, for, that's maybe with some help from you institutions, I hope, because uh, what we find is a big stumbling block would be the retrieval of, re of transcripts. And one thing we've learned is don't let it up to, don't leave it up to the applicant. And we can talk about that later. Um, so th this is a very speedy exercise. They want to get it over. They want to get into their classrooms. They want to finish their studies, and they want to increase their income and work in a job of their choice. After submitting your application, the next um, slide. How long did it take you to enroll in your first class? Two-thirds said four weeks or less. So if you look at some of your institutions, and I saw the profile of those who were with us, and you really examine those steps, all the best marketing in the world won't get you those enrollments if you have a tunnel that is staggering, if you have a tunnel that has obstacles all along the way. Uh, you have to move on. You have to move on. Um, moving to the next slide, I think we say go back to Dave. and. Talking about financial aid. Yeah, thanks, Carol. Uh, speed seems to be the modus operandi of this group of uh, college students. So we asked a, a couple of questions about a financial aid decision timeline and a companion question about uh, application to enrollment acceptance uh, and then the acceptance of transfer credit timeline and got similar responses. You see the financial aid decision timeline data in front of you. And uh, the big mismatch is that first category of when they uh, wanted to know about financial aid that they were going to receive and when they actually uh, received the information. So if you look at the legend to the right and compare it to the numbers up above, 38 per, or 30 Eight percent preferred to have the financial aid decision before they even submitted their application. Only 20 percent actually got it then. And as you go down, you'll see the big mismatch comes in in weeks. The choice is down below week three to four in over a month. Uh, 25 percent of the students reported they didn't get their financial aid decision until three to four or longer weeks later, and only 9% are down there feeling like that's when they would like to receive it. So an opportunity again here to speed up your processes and handle those financial aid decisions in a timely manner, preferably be able to give them some kind of estimate, if not the actual financial aid decision on their package before they submit their application or at least shortly thereafter. The data on credit review was even stronger. I think it was 44% there said they wanted to have the, uh, the credit transfer decision before they applied. And again, only about 20% uh, percent of institutions were able to do it that quickly. So the students decide quickly 
and they want their information quickly on which they're going to base that decision on. We'll move into some questions on a different topic now. We'll go to the next slide about uh, paying for online programs. The question here actually was which would have influenced you the most in deciding an institution? Whether you got scholarships, a free course, tuition rebate, tuition payment plans, free textbooks, and so forth. And clearly, scholarships was the big uh, preference for these students. So if you're considering uh, some kind of financial aid or scholarship program, uh, it will resonate well with this group of students. The, uh, we'll go to the next question, and it illuminates this data a little bit more. So we asked them, what size scholarship would influence your decision? And 40% said as little as $500 would influence which institution they selected to enroll in. And these numbers accumulate. Another 22% said 1,000 would get me interested. So you have two-thirds of the students that are saying a $1,000 scholarship would influence their decision. And you can see the remaining data there. So they're sensitive to tuition prices, as we said earlier. It's their major concern in selecting an institution. And scholarship offers resonate with them in terms of influence, influencing the decision of which, uh, which institution they will enroll at. We'll go to the next slide here. Yeah, so we asked a couple questions about features of online programs. In the uh, question that was uh, discussed a little bit previously uh, shows up here. We asked, uh, in terms of features of online programs, if you were required to attend an on-campus course or face-to-face -face clinical experience or required internship, how attractive would that be to you? And uh, I think when you read these charts, it's good just to look down the left-hand side and the right-hand side, the two extremes, the left-hand side being very unattractive and the right side, the dark blue, being very attractive. And you see for those top three choices, and it holds on the second page when we get to it, that there's always a group of students, uh, 10, 15, maybe as high as 20% of the students that say, really don't like this idea. On the other hand, there's again 20% that think it's great, find it very attractive, and about half the students think it's in this top two categories. So you get this mixed message again from these students about what's most important to them. You have to be able to think about offering choices and options. If we go down to the second slide, you'll see the continuation of this table where we offer asked the question, how about optional? required courses or optional courses on campus, optional clinical experiences, or optional internships. And it's better if you provide the option and not require it. But again, you get 8% that don't want to ever have to come to class, even if it's optional or internships. But you get more people when you make it optional, saying that that would be a very attractive option for them. Part of this goes back to the the data that Carol presented on about the proximity to campus and how attractive that is. More and more we find, and we had some other questions that aren't presented in this presentation but are in the study, that they're willing to go to campus for certain things and certain activities. So again, there's an opportunity here to use their proximity to get them to campus on occasion and build a different kind of relationship with them than entirely a virtual or online relationship. And they'll be responsive, at least a portion of them will. Hey Dave, it's Andrew. I just wanted to point something out, out with that slide. Uh, that data okay. is for all all 1,500 of, uh, of the participants, I believe. It's so if we take, take these same questions and split them out by, say, field of study, so I know the, one of the questions earlier was about um, you know a lab. So if you're offering an online biology degree or an online allied health degree, obviously uh, the, the students that would probably be more attractive to a program that maybe did have those lab components or those 
internship requirements because those are obviously key components of such of those programs. But if you're looking to require internships for, say, you know, a business degree or you know some other uh, program that can be done more uh, wholly online, then that's where you're going to start to see that drop off and it being seen as less less attractive, likely. So if we do think about you know the, the specific types of programs, then obviously then these numbers would jump around in terms of the level of attractiveness for some of these uh, features. That's a good point. These are these are general numbers or averages across all disciplines. So everybody needs to keep that in mind. So uh, we tried to drill down on some features of online programs that would be attractive. We know that student-to-student -student interaction is a good uh, indicator of retention. So we asked questions about uh, how often you did that and, and how you did it. And so the typical response here is posting on online message boards. That's a, a mainstay of online classes and almost all the LMSs that people are using. Commenting on other posts, same kind of concept. Uh, you can see as you work your way down the list that there's less and less uh, attractiveness to these other kinds of ways that students can interact. I think that we still have a lot of work to do to create interesting activities and courses and uh, ways for students to interact within courses. I keep thinking of a video I saw about Pokemon Go, the online game where people have to go out and meet people and visit places physically to capture. So it blends the, uh, the virtual world and the real world together. And uh, how popular that, that uh, particular game is in hoping that we can keep working and improving educational technology and instructional activities so we get more of that kind of interaction in our courses where students can uh, learn from one another. We'll move to the next uh, slide, please. So uh, we explored this notion of competency-based education. And uh, we also had some questions about uh, their knowledge and interest in things like MOOCs and badges and boot camps. And there was uh, about half the students had no knowledge of those other kinds of ways to, uh, to earn credits or to to get education and not nearly as much interest, although some interest in those activities. But when we asked about competency-based education, we found that 14% uh, had already enrolled in or completed a program, 22% said they were very familiar with it, and 25% said they were somewhat familiar with it. So uh, I think there's, again, an opportunity here that as competency-based education grows in popularity and uh, gains in the use of competency-based education occur, that uh, these people will respond to it. In previous years, we asked a question that, that's kind of similar, where we said, is your preference to be in an online class that's instructor-led, where there's a regular schedule of weekly activities and uh, assignments due and so forth, or would you prefer a class that's totally independent study? You get the materials, go through at your own pace on your own, or a third option was would you prefer a format where it was more tutorial, where you had the materials and access to a classroom, you could follow the activities and get help from an instructor, but again, be self-paced. And interestingly enough, all three of those options were equally preferred by the online student. And that, we asked that question a couple of times over the five years and got similar responses. So the, the fact is that almost all the online classes today are instructor-led, where there's a structure of weekly assignments and activities, and students are expressing, we think, in this survey response, the op the, at least the interest in competency-based programs. The assumption is that those would be self-paced, that they could go through as they demonstrate competence and move forward. So again, I think there's a nice opportunity here that's emerging for those schools that are able to build and develop and deliver competency-based programs that uh, these people will respond to it. That takes us through the uh, basic summary of the data that we pulled out of the report for uh, this presentation. 
And uh, we'll go through some key takeaways at this point. Carol, right. do you want to start with this one? I'll do. We have, uh, these are just summary statements that we think are most important in emanating from the data. And we we came up with seven that should be consciously on your mind. And the first one is quite obvious. And that this is a form of learning that is here to stay and it's growing. Uh, currently probably reaching up to 20%. Who knows how far it would go? I don't think we'll see the day where everybody's learning online, of course. But, you know, this is a growth market. And I I can remember t uh, visiting institutions years ago where I would say, well, you know, maybe online education is not for you. You should stick to your ground programs and do the best you can with hybrid. But I would find that very difficult now to say to any institution. And it's, you know, the individual can be three blocks away and want a fully online program because of life circumstances. So what's good about entering this marketplace is that it is a growth opportunity. Dave? Hey, Carol, this is, uh, this is Dave. Uh, I mentioned earlier the, this other study that Andrew and I are working on. And we're working with independent colleges and ask them about restrictions that they place on their residential students taking online courses. And there's mm -hmm. a trend there to even drop the restrictions uh, so that on-campus students can take more online courses. So right. I think that it, it doubles up the idea that online is here to stay and growing pretty rapidly. So uh, we mentioned this earlier. Oh, Go ahead. Let me just one more point about that. That's absolutely true. The colleges I visit and I work with uh, have a very serious decision on to what extent they can let the day program students engage in online learning. And usually they restrict it to two courses or one course because it's going mm -hmm. to be very difficult for those private institutions to charge thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars and parents will begin to learn that the instruction is a lot online. So there's a very very important delicate balance there. And there is. some couples uh, begin to work it out. It'd be okay. a good panel someday to talk about. Yep. So the number two takeaway yep. here, we've mentioned this earlier, but it's hard to overstate this, that uh, these students are cost sensitive. They have a difficult time judging quality. Uh, for them, quality means accreditation. Uh, and how you convey quality outside of accreditation is very difficult to do in a meaningful way. So in the absence of an indicator that the University A is a better uh, education than University B, why not take the cheapest? And so they're tending that way and it makes sense if you think about it from their point of view. So if you're not the cheapest college or option in the area, you need to think about how you can define yourself in ways that are persuasive that you're better and worth the extra cost because they're very cost sensitive. And there's one thing that you can offer them, which is almost equally important as cost, is time on task. Many institutions now are beginning to offer a three-year program uh, where they have back-to-back six-week, uh, eight, eight six-week terms or whatever way you want to break it up, and summer programs so students can finish earlier, get onto those jobs and make the income they want, and therefore they could be more acceptable of prices that are not at the bottom just to get out in that workforce uh, and uh, job requirements as quickly as they can. Uh, the next, the next uh, key takeaway has to do with the mobile devices, which I talked about earlier. I remember we had a speaker from Google at one of our seminars, and she got up on the stage, and she said three words, mobile, mobile, mobile. Now she said to the audience, what else do you want to know? <laughs> so I think that really... Uh, <laughs> Uh, preceded this, these databases that we have here now that it is extremely important and your messaging and your curriculum also has to consider ways to be delivered through mobile devices. Yeah, Carol, that's a good point. We didn't show the data here, but we asked them how, how many had used mobile devices in their classes and the majority had, and a handful had used a mobile device to do most of their classwork. So it's not just in the search process, but it's actually in the classroom too. So right, good point. Uh, folks, yeah. we have a question regarding your mobile um, questions. Can you please define mm -hmm. what you consider mobile? Uh, people were wondering if that included laptops or what exactly did you consider mobile? 
Dave, how did you think we defined it for the audience in that survey? You know, I believe it was it was Andrew, tablet Andrew, and phone. Yeah. yeah, I thought it was tablet. Yeah, I believe it was tablet and phone. I don't, it did not include laptop. Um, no, I think it was right. It was tablet yeah, it was and just, phone. Tablet and phone. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. Yep. So number four takeaway. Yep, they're fast. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're fast. They, 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 uh, they're fast on picking a school. They're fast on wanting to get their financial aid decisions and their credit transfer decisions. They're fast on wanting to get into class, and they want to get through fast. So it's a fast, uh, it's a fast population, and uh, they're highly motivated uh, because they want to get a better job or improve their work skills or improve their professional opportunities. And the faster right. they get through, they get a payment for the effort that they put in. So it's all about getting through and getting that better job or getting that raise or getting that promotion. Folks, right. we have a question regarding that as well. I actually would agree with your um, students make decisions quickly because that's how I chose my degree and got going right away. I didn't have time to wait. Good. Um, Good. Now, they're, they're wondering... Uh, how do you sell that to the faculty and staff? Because um, as distance ed directors or people who are working with programs, sometimes there are barriers within the institution. And Stephen Carter was wondering, how do you overcome the argument that it's just the way it is that we take some time to um, get back to students? Well, you know, it all depends on your web. You ahead, a Carol. lot of it depends. I'm sorry. A lot of it depends on your revenue uh, stream too. I, I haven't met many colleges that can have the luxury, unless you're, you know, the top 20 competitive institutions that can take your time in making those decisions. I I recently worked with an institution where we had to address the faculty and the deans and tell them what was what, and we had the president standing there saying, "Look, we're giving 50% discounts to our incoming." freshman, we've got to get that revenue somewhere, and when you take six weeks to admit a graduate student to a program, that's not helping. So what worked before is not is not conducive to today's audience. Within six weeks, that graduate student's already taking classes somewhere else. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's the case. It's, it's difficult to work with faculty members who don't believe that you can go fast, like an eight-week course. I mean, the typical course length is eight weeks. If you, if you look at the average and surveys we've done in previous years, and some faculty members are used to the traditional 15, 16 week semester, obviously, and they're geared to that time frame. These students are not. And so you have to make that adjustment. And uh, the fact of the matter is, it's kind of unfortunate that if you want to serve these students, you're going to have to do it at their pace. And right. Uh, I think that there are, there are ways to educate and train and develop faculty so that they're accepting of some of those practices. It takes time. It takes reinforcement. It takes lots of examples, and it takes colleagues. But we, I see in the institutions that I work with a gradual shift that more and more faculty are accepting this. More and more faculty are using okay. LMS in their traditional classes. They're on, on ground classes. And they understand that it works, and they've come around to thinking that, yeah, I can do this, or the students can do this, even if I don't want to do this. And uh, it does work, but it takes mm -hmm. time sometimes. Okay. Uh, moving on. Number five. Mm -hmm. I think that's clearly stated, and I know we're running a little bit out of time, so let me just uh, say it's location, location, location. And those of you who are who are more regional institutions, this is great news uh, because your market is easier to approach, and you know them well, and you have a reputation, and employers know you, so go for it. Those of you who are looking at a nationwide uh, audience, be it Ashford or or maybe the University of California, um, Berkeley, and so forth, uh, that's a different case. But 70% are studying with an institution close to where they live. Number six. Go ahead. Can't remember okay. what six is. We've got to call it up here. Oh, computer science and IT graduate field growing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so it's pretty obvious uh, that computer science is, is taking off. Education is declining. 
there's more nuances here, but here's an opportunity to, to offer computer science programs online and tap into this trend. Good. And finally, one of my favorites is online learning is ageless. We cannot say adult professional online programs. We cannot say working adult programs. We cannot say uh, anything labeling it with the, has an implication of age, uh, ageness. So uh, it's any age applicable to this. And I think we're going to see many more younger students as we have more demographic changes in our traditional age students that many of them are going to work earlier, get married earlier, may you know have other obligations. That online learning will will grow tremendously with this younger population, which is something we didn't think of, and we probably have to mesh that with our day programs and see, you know, is there a balance? Are we getting what we need, and is it a fair share? So uh, it's it's here to stay, and age means nothing when it comes to online learning. You can be 60 or you could be 7, 18. I think that's it, and I hope we have some questions in the last few minutes. Thank you so much, everyone. This is Tanya coming back with a few questions. Um, some of the questions that I see over in the chat box really have to do with data and citing sources and can you please just let the group know that where to find uh, this study? How to access the information? Yes, you can go to uh, either the uh, Tanzanian Market Research website or the Learning House website to download it. I believe, though, that uh, WCET is going to send a link of the presentation to uh, all of the participants on the webinar today. And you see at the bottom of the screen the uh, URL for the uh, full report download. Yes. Um, thank you so much to everyone for your great questions. We probably won't have time to get to many more questions for today, but um, we will try to work on some responses back to you. Um, also, I think some of your questions really move toward um, other studies that could be done about online learning and probably some that are already out there. Um, and WCET does a great job working with its constituents and, and attendees, so um, we'll always try to get to your questions even if they're not answered exactly today. Um, Megan, do you have any final questions or answers for the group? Thank you, Tanya. Wonderful job today facilitating this conversation. And thank you so much to Andrew, Carol, and Dave. This was a great presentation. We will get you the full report out. It looks like the link that was in the PDF isn't working. So don't worry. We'll get that out to you as soon as possible. This webcast was recorded. We'll also send you a link to the archive and the slides and uh, the responses back to the questions. So again, thank you everybody for being part of this conversation. Stay tuned to the next WCET webcast. Always visit our website to see what events and programs we have. Thank you to our WCET supporting members who underwrite much of our programming as well as our annual sponsors. So we have a wonderful list of people that stand behind us and help us put out good work. So again, thank you to per our presenters. Thank you to the 150 to almost 200 participants we had asking questions and participating today. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.